Hello there, it's Andy Ewins from FormerServe once again. In this short how-to on IBM My video set, we'll be taking a look at Git. I'm going to give you a very quick overview of the Git product on IBM I. You've probably heard about it. Git is a source control program that's been around for nearly 20 years. It's open source and very, very popular. It is the most common source control system out there. If you're thinking of delving into open source on the IBM I, you really need to know about Git. If you employ any young developers or sprogs for a PHP or a Node project, they would expect to see Git being used. It will be your friend, HonestGov. Let's get on with this presentation. We use Git on our projects and applications. It certainly helps our workflow, bugs, changes and releases. Firstly, let me emphasise that Git is for source control. It will not move objects around your environments for you. It will not know that a physical file has 15 logicals dangling off it. It is source control only. The main building block in Git is a repository. What is a repository I hear you say? A repository tracks all changes made to files and directories in your project, building a change control history over a period of time. Just as temporal tables gives you snapshots in your database, Git gives us the same functionality in our source. Files in a repository go through three stages before being under version control with Git. Untracked. The file exists, but it is not part of Git's version control. Staged. The file has been added to Git's version control, but changes have not been committed. And the final stage is committed. A snapshot of a file at that time. You can revert to this version of the file at any time. The most popular Git command by a long way. Protect your source, commit away. Let me introduce half a dozen commands that will get you on your way with Git. The first one is git init. It makes a git repository and can be formed on an existing directory or a brand new empty one. Git add which adds a file or a group of files to the list of files that Git knows about. Git commit. Git commit takes a record of your changes at that time. Each commit gives a unique 40 character ID to the commit, also known as a commit hash. Git revert, a backward move to the state of your files were in. You always revert back to a git commit hash. And on to the next two commands. Git status, very popular. Shows us a list of files that are at the three stages we mentioned earlier. Git status is used to understand what stage the files in a repository are at. The output of this command not only tells you the stages these files are at, but also gives you some handy tips on what to do next. Git log. After you have created several commits, you will probably want to go back to see what has happened. The most powerful command to do this is the git log command. Just knowing these six commands can get you started on your git experience. Let me quickly mention a special file which we widely see used in git repositories. The git ignore file. This file tells git which directories and or files or file patterns we should ignore. It is usually used to avoid committing transient files from your working directories that aren't useful to other developers. These include config files, temporary files, certificates, log files, etc. etc. It must reside in your root directory of your repository and must be named .git ignore. Before showing you Git in earnest, let me say, for all these commands, I will be using Git from a command line. I found learning Git from a command line gave me more of an understanding of what Git was actually doing. Yes, there are GUIs out there which may seem easier to use, but the majority of them lack functionality 
and you will understand it a lot more if you get to grips with the CLI version first. To install Git from a shell session, we use yum install git. I already have it installed as I have said as we use it extensively. Let me add git to an existing directory and some files within it. In my home directory on the IFS, I have a subdirectory called iug. It has four files in there, two RPG and two RPG SQL source files. I'll change over to that directory, do an ls to give me the directory listing. Here we can see these four files. The first step to take is to make this directory a git repository with a git in it. A listing shows now we have a .git subdirectory. This is what makes the directory a git repository. If I don't want to use git anymore in this directory, we just delete that directory with an rm-r for recursive.git. If I run git status on this directory, on this repository, it shows that we have four files that are untracked. Git doesn't recognize these files. To add them to the staging area, we use git add with the dot, which will add all the files. That didn't come up with any errors, so all good there. Now running a git status shows we have four files ready to be committed. To commit them, which is making a snapshot of our files, we use git commit with the minus m parameter and in quotes initial commit. The minus m flag allows us to specify a message for our commit. Very common commit message there for the first commit. The commit shows us it has added the four RPG source programs to the commit. A git status then shows us everything is up to date. A git log shows that the initial commit we made and gives the commit a unique ID, also known as the commit hash as I've already said. I'm now going to add a CL source program to this directory. From a green screen, I'm going to copy over a source member using PDM options. I've set up an option that runs the copy to import F file on a source member. We can see that here. It is copying the source member over CS020C into my IFS home directory. Back to our bash session and an ls shows that the cl program is now in our directory. A git status indicates that the new cl is untracked. A git add full stop will add this to the tracked files and a git commit will take a snapshot. Git status will now show everything is up to date. Git log shows us the two commits, the commit ID, who committed them, and the timestamp. If we, for whatever reason, need to go back to the first commit, we would copy the commit ID of that initial commit. We would then use the git reset minus hard and the commit ID. An ls now shows us that the state of the files in the initial commit. We can see we don't have the CL source in the list anymore. If we wanted to go back to our last commit with the CL source, again we use the git reset with the last commit ID. Let me look for the ID of this commit. If we run a git log now, it only shows where we are now, not the additional commit. To see the original commit ID, we run the git log minus g command. Ah, there it is. So, using this commit ID on a git reset minus minus hard will bring our CL source back for us. ls now shows we have five files in our directory. And that's how we can easily use git on our IBM i 
to manage our source. That was a quick five minutes or so showing you how you can quickly start using Git and gain the benefits of this great source control package. Yes, the learning curve can seem fairly steep and the terminology is completely different than what we are used to, but it is still well worth all the effort. Lots of our clients use Git for source control, whereas some of the others even use Git for their documentation, whereas Word, Excel, Visio, all sit within their Git repositories. Git is not too keen on large binary objects, to be honest. Far too slow with our videos. If you need any further details about open source or IBMI, check out all our videos at learning.formserve.co.uk and the articles we have written for powerwire.eu. I hope you find them useful and let us know if there are any other topics you want us to cover. And that wraps up this quick video. Thank you for watching our How To on IBMI video set. I hope you found them useful. Keep checking our website, learning.formalserve.co.uk and our YouTube channel. We regularly add new ones. Stay safe and see you soon. Mm -hmm.